This is a message to all my supporters of this podcast. I'm introducing a new supporters program. You can contribute a small amount as a one-off payment to show your love for this podcast. Thank you in advance for all your contributions. This is the Absolute Business Mindset Podcast, created and hosted by Mark Hayward. This podcast will interview entrepreneurs, business owners, and people in their careers. We will delve into their journey to success, key life milestones, and go deep into their area of expertise. This podcast will inspire and educate with great guests. Get ready to learn from other successes and failures. Today, we have Sue Knight, who is an NLP master trainer, author, coach, speaker, grandma, and cyclist. Hello, Sue. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. Um, yes, interesting times. Yes, we, well, we just had a quick chat before we came online, and uh, so COVID has been massive for you. For like you were, you were when I spoke to you originally, you were in France, and you know you've come back to the yes. UK. Yes, well, I live in France, so I've come to the UK okay. when they they relaxed the the lockdown's been really extreme in France. Right, in, I think in comparison to the UK. And it was relaxed to allow people to travel over Christmas. So I took that opportunity to come right. to be with my eldest son and family. And uh, as you're saying, we, we still don't really know when we're, we will be able to travel again. So <laughs> yes. uh, fingers crossed, you might be able to get back to France early next year. <laughs> Hopefully. The, the, the plan was to get back before the end of December. Okay. Well, um, well, so there's a few critical things at the beginning of January, but you know, what will be, will be. So. Um, okay. So let's, let's go to your sort of upbringing. So your early, your early experiences at school and sort of education, was, was there anything that you were particularly fascinated with? Was there any sort of direction your parents were giving you? I was fascinated with boys. <laughs> <laughs> what did my parents give me? Well, my dad died when I was quite young. Um, but he gave me, he was an example of somebody I never saw, for example, lose his temper. What? Um, so he gave me an example of somebody who was just completely, you know, he was a good man. Um, my mum was a very, and my mum gave me a strong independence. And I was brought up in Liverpool. So, I mean, that gave me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um and, you know, Liverpool's a source of a lot of provocative humour, and that's very much a part of my work today. So I think I was born into the right place to, to have that as part of my legacy. And, and what was it like living and brought up in Liverpool? So it's, it's, the, it's the cultural city of, of the UK. <laughs> I never thought about the cultural side. I just like the wild side. <laughs> so I grew up, you know, I was a teenager at the time of, you know, all the rise in... Um, pop music, the Beatles, uh, it was an incredible centre of music. Exactly. Uh, so it was a, quite a remarkable time to be there. Fantastic. Um, so so and, and, and sort of your, your upbringing, was, was your parents pushing you to any sort of career? Did they, have, did they try and direct you? It doesn't sound like you would listen to them, but did they try and direct you? Um, I don't, no, well, my father, he, I was too young, really, for him to do that. I mean, but he gave me a great interest in sort of general knowledge. I wouldn't say I could win any quizzes with that, but that was, and he gave me a love of being where you are. So, um, you know, he would always say that you don't need to travel abroad, which I do a lot, but he would say you don't need to travel abroad because there's so many places to explore in the UK. Yeah. And he would do that, very much explore. My family had a, a real union background, so he was a trade union organiser. My mother became a union organiser, cousins. <laughs> so, you know, I went down a very different path. He just wanted me to do something worthwhile. My mother wanted me just to do something worthwhile rather than have this passion for music and, and life, really. That was <laughs> sort of thing. She tried to rein me in, but didn't succeed particularly well. So I left 
Liverpool when I was 20 and went to London. Okay. And uh, I'm not sure in the sort of chronologically how this works, but one of your earliest roles that I could see was uh, International Computer Limited, where you were a trainer. Yes. So, yes, well, I started when I went to London. I worked in the engineering training school for English Electric. So I was a lecturer at their training school, teaching technical stuff. Right. Which was tedious. (laughs) <laughs> you know, saying the same things about computers. Although I, I mean, it's given it gave me a great grounding in computers, which were very different then. Yeah. But eventually, they were taken over, or they merged with ICT, became International Computers Limited, and I had a great development of my career in that time with them to eventually becoming uh, one of the trainers in their management and people and sales and trainer training team. So that was then, so they had a very sophisticated training program. I'd been through sales and the technical side and software engineer. Um, but that was where I was in my latter part of my career was in this training department and doing some quite sophisticated stuff on behavioral um, analysis as a source of, as a basis for training, for example, with People like Peter Honey, who some people might have heard of, he very much developed the uh, learning cycle and and so on. And and, and did that give you good grounding uh, when you came to London? Because it sounds like cause if you were in sales and you're in computing, and so it gave you a breadth of experience and a breadth of understanding I, of different. I got areas. that in London and around London, so I came to London to join them. So that was that was when that kind of work developed for me an incredible grounding because by the time I left them you know the work that I've been doing with them was very sophisticated in comparison with what many companies were doing so I had a great edge in terms of what I could offer and and then we sort of start the NLP journey which we do or or the rest rest of your life it seems to have been all consuming in so many so many different areas as I did on the intro author coach speaker uh, master trainer so so let's go back to the start just tell me for the people that don't know on, on, on my audience what NLP stands for and what it is okay it stands for neuro linguistic programming so it's a study of the way that we the way that we speak the structure of our language and the way that we program ourselves to get the results that we get um, the real intention of NLP is to study the difference between those people who excel in what they do and the rest, to find out what's the difference that makes a difference between the top people who are top of their game, outstanding performers. And the basis is that they cannot tell you how they do what they do. So NLP is a way of studying what they do to be able to discover that, which they learn about then if you happen to share it with them or they're interested to know um and of course then it's been extended into coaching so it can be used to study how people get not good results as well if people get stuck for example but essentially it's the study of excellence and it's a study which is really key and 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 it it, the is the aim to study the people that are excelling and then help other people to excel is 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 that the yeah, process to, to raise um, other people i mean the aim is to study i mean when the, the founders of nlp studied people who are outstanding in the world of um, psychotherapy that's how it got that association with therapy but i mean it can be used in any realm at all um, and they wanted to be able to reproduce the what they considered and other people considered to be outstanding results that those therapists they studied achieved. Mm. And even though those therapists were very, uh, you know, aware, very skilled, they couldn't explain what, what it was that set them apart from some of the rest. So that's the goal is to be able to study for yourself. And it could be yourself. It could be you do something exceptionally well and you think, wow, that was lucky. You know, how did I do that? I hope I repeat that. But rather than rely on hope or a guess, it's about being able to achieve consistency in the results that you want for yourself and you achieve. Now, you can then, um, having got that for yourself, you can then teach that to other people. That's what I expect my delegates to be able to do, to, to get those 
consistent results of a particular effect for themselves, but also to be able to impart it to other people as well. So we've got Richard, is it Richard Bundle and John? Richard Bundle and John Grinder. John Grinder. So so they, they were the, the, the starting point of NLP and they were the, the, the founding, founding fathers, let's say, of it. Um, yeah. But essentially for them and for, for you, it, it's the analysis stage, which is, 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 is really important to actually understand and analyze the, the individual, the, the person that's excelling. But you, but I would, I, mean, say, just, I would say, I would say rather than, I wouldn't use those words exactly. Oh. I wouldn't say understand and analyze. I would say study okay. and reproduce because there's a tendency with those words for it to be assumed to be quite an intellectual process. And it's a whole body process. I mean, one of the most effective ways of modeling somebody is to kind of get into their way of being, for example, you know, hang out with them. I mean, some of the key people I've modeled is the words, word that you'd use in LP to do that studying. Key people I've modeled. I mean, you can model people in a moment, but some of the key people I've modeled, I modeled for years. Okay. And, and what I found interesting reading autobiographies listening to autobiographies and biographies is that a lot of the great people in history and and a couple of names spring to mind steve jobs um uh, nelson mandela greats in our time and uh, excelled in their area of their field but equally their sort of private lives were pretty much car crashes because of uh their, their obsession with yes. their career and their that, how, how does that sort of fit in for, for, for you as a practitioner? In well, you don't have to take the whole package. Okay. You know, so you might choose one. And it's very important to be very specific, very detailed in something you might choose from somebody. So, for example, you might take with Nelson Mandela. How did he, you know, choose to manage his state, which I presuppose he did when he was in prison for such a length of time? Mm. Um you know, Steve Jobs, how did he get these incredibly original, innovative ideas, for example? So you choose a specific. Okay. Now, there is a risk that you'll get some of the other will rub off on you. That's why it's very important to choose people, you know, whose values you do want to share, because you'll get some of that, but you concentrate on something. So it's not necessarily going to say, oh, I'm going to become Steve Jobs. But I would really like to have that creative ability, for example. that he had. We'll be back after a quick break. Hi, I'm Alex, the host of X-Health Show. Meet the future of healthcare. Think X-Men, that's X-Health. Actual superheroes behind programming living cells to cure cancer once and for all. Tech that detects preterm delivery in seconds, brain-computer interface, or apps that employ AI to match you, your disease, with the best treatment. X-Health Show brings to you visionaries who push the boundaries of healthcare from Switzerland, the heart of Europe, and the most innovative innovative country in the world. Let me introduce you to their startups. Head to X-Health Show, meet the future of healthcare. Happy to greet you there. And, and and one of the people that I read that you've you've got a great admiration for is Gene Early. Is that right? Yes. So is that someone, he's a mentor or is a mentor of yours? Was that someone that you studied or you were in, you were with and trying to learn from, from his experiences and he's... He, the way that he conducted himself? Well, when I started um, studying NLP, he was the lead trainer on the program. And so I didn't know him before that. Okay. And there were quite a few American trainers on the program. I did two years of training initially. Um, and the American training. Full time training? Uh, not full time. It was um, every month. Um, We had long weekends and practice sessions during the week. So it was not full time every day. Mm. Um, And so there was a a real team of American trainers, primarily. They weren't exclusively American. And I'd been in training for some time by this point. I'd already left the corporate world. I was looking for how do I develop myself in terms of my abilities as an independent. And they were... They were mind-blowing in their style. It was so different to any kind of training style that I was used to. 
Mm. I mean, it was provocative. It was in the moment. It was uh, it was free, and and I was blown away by that. And I think unconsciously, without even knowing the term or the concept of modeling, I thought, I want to do that. I want to be like that. And so Jean Early was one of those people that uh, I think I unconsciously started to um, study in that way, not just the content of what he was saying, but the way he was doing it. And then we stayed connected and then we chose after a while to begin to work, or I hosted some programs for him. Then we started to work together and we've become mutual coaches. He's been my mentor and equally, I would say, you know, I would, you know, I feel like I'm on a part to coach him when we do coaching sessions. It's a very mutual coaching process now. So do you find that you, um, you're you good at creating deep relationships with people because of NLP? If I choose to. Yes, yes. if you choose to. I mean, I, I've got a lot more choices today than I had before I, you know, that before I started to learn NLP. I mean, mm. I mean, I'm, I'm quite a recluse in many ways, even though I spend a lot of my time with a lot of people. Mm. Um, so I'm on my own here. I mean, partly because I needed to quarantine for a while, uh, but I live on my own in France okay. and I really value that. So I don't know if you've ever done a fire OB um, psychometric test. No. <laughs> well, one of the categories is exclusive club. Okay. An exclusive club means you've got a few people that you're very close to. Right. And I'm I'm very much in that category, I would say. Okay, awesome. Um, so so you are actually an NLP master. And as far as I could find, there's only a few of you in the world. Is that right? That's right. And, and so what, what, what raises you to master level and what responsibilities do you have by being an NLP master? Well, it's... Um, it's a, if you like, a level that's um, attributed by one of the bodies of NLP, the Associ International Association for NLP. And um, their criteria have changed over time, but they, one of the key things was they wanted people in that category to be people who'd made a significant contribution, a unique contribution to the world of NLP. And to have had, you know, a certain, a lot of experience in this many programs that they've done. And, but that significant contribution, unique and new contribution to the world of NLP, I thought was a very important factor. Um, and so I was recognised as being somebody who has done that. Fantastic. Um, Do you want to know in what way? <laughs> go on, yeah. Well, I introduced NLP to the business world. Ah, interesting. Okay. So, you know, my book was NLP at Work, which has a deliberately ambiguous title, meaning it's NLP at work, at the way things are at work in our everyday lives, but it's also at work because the publisher who invited me to write that knew that I had a business background mm. and he wanted to be, and he knew that that was really leading edge at the time. And he wanted to connect the two together. And he knew that I was already doing that. I was bringing NLP concepts into corporates that I was working with at the time. Right. Um, and that hardly anybody else had started to do that. So you, it's, it's been translated into 27 languages, which yes. is incredible. And just to delve a little bit into the, the whole piece of um that it's at, at, at work, the, the, the book. I think you're on your fourth edition or fifth edition that you've... Fourth, fourth edition. Fourth edition. And I, what, what fascinates me is that using some of those techniques and, and using them in work, are you working with individuals, teams, whole companies? How do you, how do you sort been, of... It's been all of those things. Okay. There have been trends in that. So, so, you know, there was a time when I would say... The majority of my work was coaching people individually, and those could have been directors in companies. And, and there was a time when working with corporate teams was a big part of my work or designing programs for the whole of a company. Um, but today, and of course, it's been a big change since the um, COVID arrived because I'm working online now. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the thread today is the open programs leading to certification for other people. So there are levels of certification that people can do. And that's been, you know, that's just what I'm being asked to do. So that's where my 
even my concentration is now. So it varies over time. So doing online certification programs has been absolutely what I've been doing this year. Okay. Okay. And, um, and if you, uh, I just say something about the business space as well, that that was, you know, the kind of leading edge for me. Mm. However, you really only get these concepts if you get them personally, first of all. Right. And so if people think they're going to come in and learn how to conduct an appraisal or how to do an interview, they will, but that's not going to be the focus. The focus is going to be let them learning their patterns and how to resolve issues for themselves so that they have an, they are then an example of those things. It's like, for example, to be able to manage a team well, you need to be able to manage your inner team, first of all. Right. You're in conflict with yourself. How are you going to resolve? So that's something I, so I'm almost at the point of taking business out of, I call my practitioner business practitioner, but I'm almost at the point of taking that out because there's just a risk that some people will come thinking it's just for how you use it out there when it's very much about how you develop yourself. Interesting. Interesting. Right. Take a step out of, uh, of your sort of career. Um, just a, sort of random question do you do you have a morning routine do i have a depends where i am <laughs> okay because i can you know well i suppose this year has been different because i have until now i've been in france since march mm. normally i'd be in many different places in the world normally i'd be in india at this time of the year um here do I, well there's one routine that probably persists if i'm at kind of a home and that would be to make coffee. <laughs> <laughs> There's no elaborate meditation, re- reading, journaling, put a pot of coffee on. Have oh, a pot of coffee. No, it's got to be an espresso. Ah, coffee. an espresso. Okay. <laughs> and that kickstarts you for the rest of the day, does it? it? just It's just my time to think about the day just to kind of come to. So that's important, having reflecting. If I'm in France, I might then cycle. So I'll cycle in the mornings, okay. not every day, but often. So time to just let things sort of unfold, I suppose is the word. <laughs> it's important. And your keenness on cycling, it's interesting that you, you've sort of, how long have you been sort of, it sounds like when I read your website, you were, you, it was quite something you're passionate about. So how long has cycling been part of your life as a regular exercise and sort of about uh, 20 about 20 years wow okay amazing yeah and that was all from from being in france or uh, no not at all um that was from (laughs) wanting so that was from my husband at the time from wanting to join him in activities and he was a cyclist so I thought well I better learn how to do this really <laughs> if we're going to do more things together um and so he got me it was it was him cycling that encouraged me to take up cycling and I probably took it on more seriously than than he did eventually I've got my bike here with me outside this cabin where I'm staying as well uh fantastic um so when we were talking about NLP, I, I, I got a quote from somewhere that I was doing your reading, and it says about analysing strategies used by successful individuals and applying them to personal goals. I'm still and, thinking about the cycling. Sorry, oh, sorry. Because <laughs> <laughs> you said it's... Sorry, I do jump around a little bit. You do, you certainly do. Um, because... Um, I mean, I've studied a lot about what makes a difference in cycling. Right. Um, and I want to, you know, sort of challenge stereotypes. So, you know, I'm an older woman. Um, there are many older women who cycle. Um, but I think a lot of people, especially when I meet, for example, women in India, this would not be the usual thing to do, to go and cycle out. And I cycle alone a lot. Right. And I cycle, you know, quite some distances at times. And... And and so part of the, if you like, the coaching that I do, whether it's individual or with a group, is to challenge people's limiting beliefs. You know, that's often the key to them finding their own potential. So being an example that challenges stereotypes is important to me. I mean, I love cycling, 
But that is a part of it. You know, it's like not to let a number limit what I believe is possible. So how many kilometres do you do a week? About, it depends where I am, maybe 200. Wow, okay. Yeah, so it's very serious. (laughs) So you're talking 20, 30 kilometres? If I do a... You know, it's like a weekend run could be would be fifty kilometers. Okay, okay, nice, nice. And something I've because something I've always wondered: how do you do? You have certain routes, certain routes that you have where wherever you are that that you do, and that's fifty k, and you've measured it out or or done it. Uh, not necessarily measured it, but you know what I mean. Like well, I do measure it because you know I, I'm on Strava, so that yeah. records the routes and the distances. So I'll go for extending the distance i mean i was i did a tour in india i was doing on a tour uh you know with a indian cycling team at this time last year mm. well they were doing 130k in so a day um and so they determined the routes right. when i'm in france well i share routes with with friends you know they'll mm. say we've done this route it's a good one you know it's a, and so because they're on strava yeah uh we can we can share the routes so yeah, you, the certain ones that you think, yeah, I'll do that route today because either that's a fairly flat one or I want some challenges with the hills. I usually go for flatter ones if I can, but I don't live in a in a flat area. No, um, it's quite. But I'll aim for a certain distance. And, and, and so Strava is a great great app for you to share share routes and and oh, share times with. It's an amazing amazing app. Uh, um, how do, how do you sort of compare to your uh, your friends? Are you, are you faster? No, they're better than me. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're my, I'm trying to think of a friend who's slow. Probably I've got someone who's slower than me, but um, they're pretty good, actually, um, which is great because they're an inspiration mm. for me mm. uh, in cycling. And how, you know, how when how I was on the... Do you have? Sorry? How, how many, many bikes? bikes do you have? Well, I've actually got about 10, but I don't use all those. They're for guests <laughs> as well. What is it cyclists that collect that collect yes. it's, it's, it's I've a, got a very nice bike with me here. But I have another bike on a fixed trainer back home. So when we couldn't cycle out in France, I was using yeah. Swift, which is an yeah. online app, which yeah. is phenomenal, you know, to yeah. go into these virtual worlds. Yeah. Um so I have a bike for that. And I have a, like a backup bike and have you have you got the Peloton? No, I've got a, I've got, got um, one. You've got we use my own bike, bike fixed on a trainer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because um, a, a couple of friends of mine have, have gone the whole hog and and gone for a Peloton bike, and they say it's it's amazing. And and the gyms that I used to use, not the one I go to at the moment, the one I used before, they would have on a sort of iPad size, and you could do. Um, you could do set climbs around the world yes. and there would be like three or four climbs that you'd go from, I don't know, like Alpe d'Huez in, in France and then you'd yes. Italy, Italy and then, well, and it would be exactly the same. Exactly. Uh, well, it's the same on Swift. So this yeah. year I've ridden in Central Park in New York. Um, I've ridden around Halifax, <laughs> into the countryside, there, up Box Hill in London, you know, so, it's amazing. And then into the virtual worlds, which, you know, through volcanoes underneath, that's just, it's escapism. And do the, very, it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant tool. Do you do the spin classes? I used to. Um, but you see, with, with that, with Swift, you get these routes. So it's not like the Peloton in that sense. But I used to do spin classes, cyclist dedicated spin classes years ago. But no, I just do my own spin classes these days. <laughs> Well, that's fantastic. Okay, back to my question where I was going to ask about, it was a quote that I saw, um, I think it was on your website, where it said that NLP is analysing strategies used by successful individuals and applied to personal goals. Now, the slight difference... I don't think you saw that on my website. (laughs) I did. I'm pretty sure I did see it somewhere. Tell me where it is then. I don't think I'd use it. Maybe you've forgotten where it is. The interesting point that I got from from that explanation was personal goals, which is slightly slightly different because I know you said your angle was business and and sort of yeah, that's why I don't I would have said that. 
Okay, so his personal goal was into somebody else's website. Then no, 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 no. I'm very, <laughs> I'm very careful. I don't, I don't Wikipedia. There's no way I'm getting anything on Wikipedia. I'm, I'm not yeah. quoting anything from there, and 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 I only go to people's own website. All right, let's move on then. Um, so, so it's about choosing what go whatever the goals are for yourself. But it's like choosing something, an effect. So, for example. You know, when I first witnessed um, Gene Early, who you mentioned, working, what struck me was that he was working with a group of about 100 people. And I felt that he was speaking to me personally. And that felt remarkable because of that. And then I spoke to other people and they said more or less the same thing. And I thought, well, isn't that incredible? You know, that rather than somebody who's just up there doing a presentation that's kind of remote, Here's somebody that's engaging with us and connecting with each person in this group individually. Yeah. And I thought, that's what I want to do. And that was unconsciously a goal that I set myself. But by being with him and studying him, there were many other things. I wanted to have that style of training where people experience that and feel that kind of result. They feel I'm speaking to them personally. It's very unique. It's very real time. It's individual. Um, so that's an example, but, you know, and equally, you know, I studied how to cycle, you know, effectively up hills on my bike, for example. Mm. Um, but I've also studied, you know, how to influence somebody who's interested in a topic to say yes to it. So it could be any of those things, any of those kinds of things. And you, you, you certainly do have a global brand. Um, you've got, been venues where you do uh events in india uk france south africa senegal doha greece amman so so this is this is a global brand that you've created and yes absolutely. And, and, and i suppose it transcends all cultures and all, all all sort of places does it well it's a way of really learning how to be in a culture because because you're studying so it's you know it's so if i go to a place you know, like India is a very important place for me. It's a very classic place. It's somewhere I've really committed to over many years now. So I think that, I mean, I've had tremendous, I have tremendous friends there who've taught me a lot about being, how to be in India. And equally, with the studying skills I have with NLP, I've also been able to study what they do. It's important to respect, to be uh, respectful and to be, included in that culture as well so it's very valuable in that context of moving into different cultures because there's such different things that are important that you don't get taught you don't certainly don't get taught like in France you don't get taught this stuff in French lessons Mm -hmm. Um, and yet there are very fundamental things that when you when you watch and you listen you think wow this is what people do and it's very important if I don't do that you know I'm going to be I'm going to have a different people are going to take a different attitude towards me that's absolutely fascinating because um my previous life i worked for big four consultancy firms in global mobility so corporations send in their employees around the world on assignments etc and um this was le- less so recently i suppose i slightly moved away from the pure at global mobility but there were cultural so say someone was was us and he moved to um 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 dubai or china or something like that they would give cultural lessons to that person traveling around and that that was an incredibly helpful because the number of people that you speak to because you help people throughout their whole three-year span of being in a in a country and and they said that like obviously moving there and and moving costs is obviously important but actually understanding how you're going to embed yourself into a culture like like China, for example, would be so important, so crucial for for someone moving there for three years. I mean, there's such differences. You know, for example, in France, um, you'd be much more likely to say, you know, on on that on the one wants, one would like, one is going, mm. which is a very what I would call a dissociated way of saying things. Mm. So, you know, I would often encourage people in the UK to say, I want, I would like, you know, I do. Um, and I, you know, I explored that 
And it's got a very different meaning in France. You know, it expresses that you're part of a community. If you say one does this, it means, you know, we do this together. Mm. Um, and, and so many things are, because I live in rural France, there's so many things that happen non-verbally that are an expression of connected community, mm. which which don't, they're not in the language, they're not in the, the behaviour in the same way. You know, it's a, it's a real surprise to me if I'm, you know, even though, you know, I'm from the UK, but it's been a while since I've been here, past people, and they don't automatically say hello, bonjour. Oh, no, no. You know, it's the norm in France, and it's very rude not to do that, to go into a shop or something. And um, I never got taught that in French lessons. And but the way inter- people look. Sorry, I was just going to say, it's interesting. Like, yeah, I think it might be a, uh, I'm making an assumption here, a rural thing, because yes. when, when, when we, we spend quite a bit of time in Norfolk and when we're walking the dog along yes. the beach, a deserted beach where there's only half a dozen people on there or walking through this yes. Thetford yes. Forest, you walk through the forest and you see someone else there, you will always say, hello, good morning. Yes. Like, sort of, in London, there is no way you're going to walk no. down a street and a, a, a street. Of course, and you wouldn't in Paris. But however, I think one thing, like you'd go into a bar in rural, and even if you don't know anybody, you'd still say to everybody, right. bonjour, monsieur dame. Right. right. So you, are, you look at everybody, mm. which that would not be the no, norm. That's unusual. In places in the UK. Um, so, so you split your your time between France and India mainly. Um, so, tell me a little bit about the the India experience for you. What, what's what's given you the fascination to spend so much time over there? Gosh, um, I think it's it's the people primarily. And it's very nice to be away from UK winters and French winters as well. So, um, to be in a tropical climate, it's the people. And their passion for learning. So they put teachers on a, they will say, you know, what's important in life? It's like uh, your mother, your father, God, and teachers. And they have them in a particular order as well. Right. Teachers come very high up. Right. So they are dedicated to learning in a very, very respectful way. And the consequence of that is that, you know, I'm, I'm not faced with, um, people go, are you sure that works? You, you know, you don't, you don't get cynicism about learning. They'll take it. And then, of course, they can do what they wish with it. So they actually learn far more effectively. And they are so, I, I think there's an incredible, you can't, um, you're immersed in spirituality in India. Okay. Right, right. You know, it's like it's present in everybody, in everything. Um, it's not like in, you know, in France or the UK where maybe people have a faith or something in that realm. In India, it's just omnipresent. And there's an incredible sense of, I think, just I recognise my small place in this world, in this universe. And I have a humility because of that. You know, so there's just a sense of greater than self, of things greater than self, Um and the humility that people show and the gratitude that people show for getting learning is humbling, to be honest. It's um, it's moving. Um, and everything's so seemingly chaotic, you know, and you could take the traffic. And yet there's a remarkable structure within that traffic where everybody looks after themselves. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if I pull out, and I cycle a lot in India, if I pull out on my bike, I mean, I do need to be careful and you do but things will wend their way around me um and everybody looks out for themselves rather than oh you know you pulled out across a you know a give way sign or a stop sign and people blast you well they just they blast for different reasons in india Mm. but you take care of yourself and i like that it's interesting um the UK, France, and India don't necessarily seem to have a harmonious strand of of, of understanding. But I, I I do get. I've spent quite a lot of time in France uh, with my wife, and um, before we had kids, and then also when we've had kids, and um, and there's there's a community in France, especially rural France. You get that yes. a lot, a lot more than Paris, um, yes. let's say. Um, 
And it sounds like in India, I've never actually been to India, so I, I totally cannot co comment, but it sounds like there's a, there's, you're webbed, you're, you're enmeshed in a group, you're in, enmeshed into, oh, yes. into a larger community. Always. Than you know, so they, it kind of shocks them, especially some of the ladies I know in India that I live on my own, I will cycle on my own. Somebody said to me once, it really struck me, she said, I've never learned to be on my own. Mm. Yeah, I live with my family mm. then you go to the husband's family yeah. you're never and the, um, as a trainer in NLP um, for me training in NLP is about designing experiences for people mm. where you can study and they can study what patterns emerge in different experiences mm. so you get you, it's like how to reveal what their habits are mm. and whether those habits are helpful to them or not um so i it's not if i just talk to them i'm not going to get that information so it's like how do i create experiences well in india i don't have to create experiences the whole place is an experience yes. so for the minute they arrive at the airport and they're faced with the traffic and i can you know watch their reactions to being in that traffic for example um or watch their reactions to being going to visit an orphanage um or watch their reactions to how people engage with them on the street. There's so much to learn from that. So India is an experience. It's full on experience. Um, so I don't have to do much designing there. Just take them there and just take them out for learning. a walk or a cycle. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, our mutual friend, Mark Ridley, um, I was talking to him about NLP and about his coaching that he does. And, um, he said to me that he sees himself as a provocative coach to really push people and, and be provocative. And, and again, with the reading that I was doing earlier on about your courses, there, there, were, there seemed to, the word seemed to come up not regularly, but it seemed to be there that as an NLP coach to be provocative and force people against their... Oh, no, I wouldn't say force. Um, okay. I would say I... I, because I studied and modelled Frank Farrelly, who was considered to be the master of provocative therapy. Mm. Um, so I, I kind of hung around him in the way I hung around Jean Early for over 20 years. Mm. Um, and that's very much a part of my style. So that's something I modelled in him and very much fits with my Liverpool background. <laughs> um, it's not automatically a part of NLP, but however, I do believe and my experience is it's one of the most um, powerful ways of coaching. It's certainly not about forcing people. You know, provoking means that you might say things. Well, you know, for example, people being in experiences in India provokes reactions. Yes. But you're not forcing them to do no, that. True, true. So you might say things or do things almost tangentially that they are provoked by. Provoked in the sense of it triggers something in them. It's not about people misunderstand the use of the word in that context. Um, Are you trying to shock them? Not necessarily shock. You're trying to shake them a little, you know, shake them in terms of perhaps set thinking patterns that they've got within themselves. I mean, you know, you get people who always had plans to, Set, you know, do their own business, strike out on their own, for example, but they've never got around to doing it. You know, they always stick with the company. And so, you know, a provocative question, as an example, might be say, well, you know, just how many good years do you think you've got left? And, um, and you know, they might be, especially somebody who's procrastinated, might go, oh, you know, they say they're 15, they might go, oh, I've got, you know, 30 good years ago no, realistically come on you when did, when did your parents die <laughs> and so you say things that kind of you speak the truth mm. with a humor that makes them really take stock and connect with that truth for themselves that's a very important part of what provocative so it's very often things not said directly to somebody you know i might tell a story that's got a provocative message in it and they can connect with that story if mm. they choose to I tell it for them um but it's still being run by them it's a bit like sitting in front of a sushi belt you know you, these things are running by you mm. and there's going to be some that attract your eye and some will make you you know reach out and pick one up it's like that 
Right. Do you have a coach or a mentor at the moment? Do I have a coach? Coach or a mentor at the moment? Well, Jean Early is very much, if I'm, you know, if I've got issues, I will, we'll talk together. Okay. Um, definitely. And I have friends who, you know, have worked with me a lot over the years who I will, so people in the UK typically, uh, who I will talk with, you know, who I know will confront me in the kind of same way. They're not going to just reassure me. You know, So the one thing, for example, that provocative coaching doesn't do, you don't rescue people. And I find that's a temptation. Most people, there's a big difference when you're using provocative coaching and NLP coaching. You know, so NLP coaching, for example, you're not involved in the content. The content's irrelevant. It's the patterns and the structure of people that's really important. Um, you can almost disregard the content of what they're saying. Whereas a lot of people, certainly new coaches, get very seduced by the content and get into stuff. Well, that's not helpful in my view. And provocative coaching, you do not rescue. You do not reassure. You know, so if somebody says, well, oh, I, you know, if they're playing the victim, for example, in life, and going, well, you know, nothing's worked out for me. I remember Frank Pramley saying to somebody, well, not all the seeds in a garden bloom. So, you know, you're probably <laughs> one of them. So you wouldn't go, I'm sure it'll be all right. You don't do that. You know, you push people with maybe a kind of amused comment that puts them further down the route they're taking themselves yeah. to the point where they go enough for themselves and they find that point to put their own stake in the ground, if you like. Fantastic. All right, we're coming to the end of the interview. I ask the same six questions to all of my guests. Um, they're short, <laughs> sharp questions, but they don't need short, sharp answers. It's up to you. Uh, the first one is, what's the best decision that you made? God, you know, I'm a person who likes choices. I don't like to stick to one thing. <laughs> well, but the thing that came to mind, the thing that came to mind I mean, I've got to think, but I had children and that was a major, that was a very big decision. But leaving the corporate world and setting up on my own. Fantastic. Fantastic. And you've been successful. How many years has is, is, is Sue, Sue Knight been? 30, no, 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 something. I don't know. I lose track of lots. A long time. Awesome. What's the best advice you've been given? Um, it wasn't advice. It was, a, oh, well, there's two. One was when I was thinking about leaving the corporate world, and it was a question. I took a consultant who'd worked with us for the day to the station. He'd been, we were doing transaction analysis as a topic. And I was telling about the dilemma I had about, I'd been offered a job in the corporate world that had been created for me, but, you know, I'd had this hankering to go independent. And all he said to me as he got out of the car to get to the train was, what do you really want? That was profound. And the other piece of advice was with Jean Early, when I actually had built up my business, had a team of associates, but I was doing much more of the managing than the delivering. And it was really getting me down, actually. It wasn't what I wanted to do. And I'd been trying to sell the business and I hadn't succeeded in that. There were lots of disputes within you know, the, uh, my colleagues as to who would buy it, who would take it on. And he said, give it to them. <laughs> give it to them. He said, give it to them. And did you? I tried to. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. But they couldn't they didn't succeed with it, but I did, yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, we've covered a couple of people, but I asked this the question, so I'm gonna ask you again. Who's the person that's helped you most in your career? Oof, I can't stick to one. You know, well, my mother gave me such an incredible streak of independence and rebellion. Um, certainly Jean. Frank Farrelly, because of this humour, which is quite, you know, it's not standard, you know, it's not an NLP standard thing, yeah. um, but it's one of the ways in which people do identify with me, you know, that I have this particular, st that's part of my style. So I owe a lot to Frank Farrelly. Um, <laughs> he, was, he was a genius, undoubtedly. Thank you. Uh, do you have any regrets? No. Sure. Regrets. I don't really believe in regret. Fair enough. Fair enough. I believe that things. You said, you said I believe that things happen for a reason. Mm. Yeah. And that you know, I also believe that well, what is is, what will be will be. Okay. And there's no point, you know, getting. I'm not to say I don't ever get hung up about things, but that's fundamentally my belief about life. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Um, what are you most proud of? 
my sons. We get, we haven't actually touched touched on you being a grandma as well. I mean, <laughs> oh, my the, grandkids, but I don't feel they're directly my yeah. work. But they are obviously <laughs> they're amazing. But they then any, in the UK? Yes, three of them. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Um, so, do they come and visit pre-COVID, or will they? Come yes, in France, absolutely. So the whole place is absolutely perfect for them. But you know, my sons. Um, I did a TED talk uh, one time and. I spoke about my younger son who's in New Zealand. Um, and I am, I think I always sought to encourage my sons to do what they really wanted to do, mm. not to kind of impose my thoughts. Right. And I believe they have. Fantastic. Quite Fantastic. extreme things too. And, and, and as a parent myself, I've got two girls, four and six. That's all we really want as a, as a parent is to give your children enough choices to be able to do what they really want to do. Well, I thought, I felt they got their own choices. I wouldn't have chosen for them what they chose. I mean, one son chose to be in the Royal Marines. All right, okay. And the other son chose to work in jungles and work with conservation of wild animals. Right. And now he's learning to fly. It's a very different career. But I always sought to say yes to them. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. And what does legacy mean to you? It means um, creating and supporting communities around the world who share values that are to do with the well-being of everybody and the support of each other, kind of living together in with kindness, with trust, with respect for each other. So the more people I can train and the more communities of people I can help do that, uh, then I'd be, I'll be happy with that. That is the best answer I've ever had for that question. <laughs> <laughs> by some, by what some. other answers do you get? <laughs> oh, um, a lot of it is um, having an impact after I die and sort of ha ha making a positive impact on the world. And, and, and there's a lot of the things that you say, but it was just you put it so eloquently. You, I often get some – it's often for their kids – whatever their business is that it's ready for their kids oh, right. whether they buy yeah. sell or whatever they do with it a lot of it is having an impact after they die um but no it was just it was, you very eloquently put but if you if you have you ever read anything by paul hawken no will you look up a commencement address by paul hawken and he talks about these bodies of people who like underground are making a, made a difference in the world. You know, it was part of the industrial revolution. Yeah. He's just got remarkable ways of expressing himself and thinking, you know, for example, you know, one of the things he says is, you know, um, if the stars only came out, you know, once every million years or a thousand years, actually there was a, an event last night, wasn't there, Jupiter and Saturn. Yes. He said then people would come out and they'd all turn to religion as a consequence but the stars come out every night, so people sit inside and watch the TV. <laughs> so true. So true. I love that. I love that. Um, and the last thing I ask everyone is, where can people find you if they want to reach out to you? Um, on my website, through my website, or just go sue at suenight.com. Perfect. Thank you so much, Sue. That's been totally fascinating speaking to you. Thank you so much for your time. I have enjoyed it. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks. Thank you.